Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters in Christ. Every story needs a villain. Every Batman needs his Joker. Every Sherlock Holmes needs his Moriarty, right? If a story doesn't have a villain or any kind of conflict, then it is not very interesting. And if a story does have a good guy and a bad guy, it's the most interesting when they're pretty evenly matched, right? Otherwise, if the good guy is way overpowered compared to the bad guy, then the final battle will happen, the conflict will happen, the climax, and it's not all that exciting because you already know who's going to win. Haven't we seen that and been very bored by that? Too many, unfortunately, the events that occur in Genesis chapter 3, the, the text that we'll focus on this evening, it's just a story to many. It's just a story, a fable that maybe explains why people are afraid of snakes, that explains uh, why you should uh, do this or that. It's just a metaphor. It's just a, a made-up fairy tale. But that's certainly not how the New Testament authors, that's not how the early Christian church interpreted it. That's not how we interpret it. We interpret it not just as a story. But in this story, in, the, in these verses, we are certainly introduced to a villain-type character, right? There's this serpent, whoever it is. This serpent comes in, and the serpent is able to talk. You get the talking animals thing. He's able to deceive Adam and Eve. He's got something, some ulterior motives. The New Testament authors in the early Christian church were, were pretty unanimous in interpreting that this serpent is the devil, which means liar, or his alternate name, Satan, which means adversary, villain, right? But to the people who think that this is a fable, a fairy tale, they say that that's not fair, that you can't use the New Testament to interpret the Old Testament. Of course, as believers in the whole Bible, we're perfectly fine doing that. We believe that the whole Bible is a central message that centers on Jesus. But let's play their game for just a second. What clues in this lesson do you have that the serpent is the devil? What does he do? He shows up. When everything is fine, when everything is perfect, when Adam and Eve were enjoying a perfect existence, perfect relationship with God, and what does the serpent want to do? He wants to mess that up. And so he opens his mouth, and he talks, and he deceives, and he clearly has an agenda in mind. So he shows up, he talks like the devil, he acts like the devil, he has the same goals that the devil has. I think we can say that this is the devil, looks like the devil, talks like the devil, just in a serpent form. So the serpent shows up, the devil in a serpent form, and talks to Eve and says, Did God really say? Did God really say you weren't supposed to eat from every tree in the garden? Of course, the simple answer is yes, he did. But here the devil is, in Genesis chapter 3, right in the beginning, doing the exact same thing, that he does to us. Because the devil knows that your relationship with God depends 100% on what God has said, on God's words. And so if the devil can sow seeds of doubt and get you to unseat your trust in what God has said to you, then he can wreak havoc on your relationship with God. Did God really say Do you think God actually cares if your eyes linger at the neckline of a young lady? Does God really not understand why you're upset with your brother-in-law? I mean, come on, after what he did to you? Did God really say that we should love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us? Come on. Did God really say? It's the same tactic as happened in the garden. You've got to give it to Eve. She survives the first round of this battle. She rebuts the devil's temptation by reminding him and herself what she did hear the Lord say. She does good so far, but she makes a fatal mistake. She sticks around. When the devil shows up and it's clear what his motives are, the smart thing to do probably would have been to leave, but she stays there so that he can launch his second attack. You will not certainly die, 
God just knows that if you eat from this tree, you will become like him. You will know good and evil. What is he doing? The same thing he does to us, brothers and sisters. Not only does the devil try to paint sin, what God calls evil, as good, and what God calls good as evil, but the devil tries to get us to think that maybe God doesn't know what he's talking about. Maybe all God is doing is trying to keep you from having any fun. Maybe all God is doing is he's trying to keep you under his thumb and under his control. What if you did do what you want to do? Don't you, don't you want to? And what if you just took the plunge and just found out what it was like? You might be better off having this knowledge of what it's like to do what you're planning to do, the devil says. And that's when it happens, right? Adam and Eve, they look at the fruit and they, they see that it is desirable, that it looks like it tastes good to some degree. And the prospect of gaining wisdom, of gaining knowledge of good and evil sounds pretty good to them in the moment. So they take that bite and they find out that the devil was half right. They found some stuff out when they ate from that fruit, didn't they? They found out what it's like to be evil. Because now that's what they are, compared to what they were, just good, just perfect. Now evil and sin is in the picture, and now evil and sin is all our nature knows. This is not knowledge that they would have wanted to have. I don't know what it's like to be attacked by a shark. And that's not knowledge that I particularly desire. Some knowledge, experiential knowledge, is not knowledge you need. But now, because of the fall into sin that happened with our first parents, Adam and Eve, sin is all we know by nature. You know, villains in stories, they, they have to be equal to the main character, equal to the hero in power, and there has to be this exciting conflict at the end in order to keep our attention, keep us entertained. But what about history? I've already said that Genesis 3, we interpret as Bible-believing Christians, as history. This is our human history. These are our first parents we're talking about. This is where sin came from. In history, you definitely have villains. You have bad actors. You have evil characters, certainly. But when their end comes about the, in, in true events, it's not nearly as exciting as a fictional movie, is it? When the the... the malevolent dictator is finally overthrown, his death or his imprisonment comes around in a pretty predictable way, right? A major evil person in history takes their own life in an underground bunker pretty much right when you would expect him to. History isn't nearly as interesting in that way. The devil is the villain in this story, certainly, and how does his end come about? doesn't really play out in a way that would be very entertaining if you're watching this as a movie, but this Genesis 3 is not written for our entertainment. It's written for us to know our history. And God spoils the ending. God tells the devil, he tells us exactly how his end comes about. Did you catch it? Genesis 3, 15. Who was the first person to hear a promise of a savior. Who was the first audience to hear God declare that he was going to send a Messiah to save us from our sin, to undo the evil that happened in the world? The first person to hear that promise was the devil. The first promise came in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15, and I will put enmity between you, Satan, and the woman. Between your offspring and hers, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. The most interesting stories are the ones in which the hero and the villain are equally matched, and that is not true about God and the devil, is it? The devil is not God's counterpart. The devil is far outmatched by God. The devil is sitting right there moments after tempting Adam and Eve, and he has to sit there and hear about his own demise. God's response to the fall into sin was to point the finger at the devil and say, you're through. Your days are numbered. Fast forward. 
many, many, many years in our history, in our human history. Jesus is in the wilderness fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. He's quite hungry. In his human state, he is, he is in his state of humiliation. He is famished. He's weak. And the devil shows up and he tempts Jesus in much the same way that he, he tempted Eve, only with much more force. He says to Jesus, if you are the Son of God, if you are the promised Messiah, tell these stones, hungry man, to become bread. If you're so great, can't you do whatever you want, Jesus? And then he says, if you're so great, Jesus, stand on the top of this temple with me and let's hop off. Because doesn't your God say that if you are in danger, he'll send his angels to guard you? Why don't you see if that's true, Jesus? And then he takes Jesus to the top of a mountain. He shows him all the kingdoms of the world. And he says, Jesus, if you are God in the flesh, like you say you are, then that means you can do whatever you want. That means that you could give up this whole cross stuff, all this suffering stuff that you keep talking about, and you could just worship me. You could just abandon this mission that you're on and get with me, and we could go do something completely different. Jesus tempting, Satan tempting Jesus with full force. Now, Eve did a pretty good job for just a second, and then she fell. But she had probably had enough to eat that day and got a full night of sleep. Here Jesus is starved out of his mind. How does he do? He knocks it out of the park. He resists the devil at every turn. At every temptation, Jesus does not budge from his mission. Why? Because the power of your Savior's love for you far outweighs the devil's hatred of you. The devil wants to unseat God from your heart, wants, you to, wants to drag you to hell with him, wants you to suffer with him. But Jesus wants you as his own so much more. And so Jesus withstood the devil's temptations. Why? Because he was winning righteousness for you. So that through faith in Christ, you could be wrapped up in his righteousness, undoing what Adam and Eve had done, undoing what you have done in your sin, covering you with his righteousness and his obedience and claiming you as his own. The devil has no authority over you. You belong to Christ. The devil cannot claim you for one second because you belong to Christ. How could Jesus withstand the devil's temptations? Because he had one thing on his mind. Genesis 3.15 He came as God in the flesh, God himself, but the human son of a woman, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem you. And nothing was going to shake Jesus from his mission of love and grace to save you. So now that you belong to Christ, you know where you stand before God. All of your sins are taken away. All of your unrighteousness is forgotten and thrown into the sea. You are good with God. You are going to heaven through Jesus. Remind the devil of that. If he comes back trying to sow seeds of doubt, saying that God doesn't know what he's talking about, or that you shouldn't trust God, or take him at his word when he says that you're forgiven, or when he says that he's always with you, remind the devil that you belong to God. That nothing he's, he can say will ever change that. Mind the devil of what, the, what God said in the garden, that his demise, his defeat, is absolutely sure. And Jesus' victory has already been won. Now that you are victorious in Christ, the devil has no claim over you. His defeat is sure. And so walk with us. Over the course of this Lenten season, throughout these midweek services, we'll take a closer look at the promises God has made about what the Savior would accomplish. Walk with us and see how he accomplished that, how Jesus made good on God's promise all the way back in Genesis 3 in the garden so that we can rejoice at Easter in seeing our victorious Savior, which at the same time was the devil's defeat and your victory as well. Amen. Thank you.